Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another exciting Curbivore Coffee Break. Going to wait one second while people fill into the uh, virtual attendee hall, then we'll get started. Got a great topic today, coding the curb, using data to rethink the street and sidewalk. Really exciting about uh, this group of experts we've brought together. So moderating today's discussion is uh, Andrew Glass Hastings, the new executive director of the Open Mobility Foundation. Then we have Maddie Schaefer, the CEO and co-founder of VADE, Dr. Regina Clulo, CEO and co-founder of Populous, and Kirby Olson, representing new mobility at the Oakland Department of Transportation. And so uh, take it away, Andrew. Awesome. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for, for joining us, spending the next hour here uh, nerding out on, on the, the curb. Uh, I'm really glad to be here and uh, on this particular topic, of course. Um, thanks, Jonah. Uh, thanks, Curbivore, for hosting this today. Uh, thanks to our panelists for joining. Um, we're going to get into some of the, the nitty gritty on, on coding the curb and exactly what that means, um, especially for, for all of us living in, uh, living and using, using cities. So I like to, I love, uh, like to start off curb conversations by like, talking about my perspective that uh, I think curb, although my real estate friends probably disagree with me, but I think the curb is some of the most valuable uh, real estate in cities today. You think about all the demands on relatively little amount of space, everything from you know, commercial and passenger loading, just trying to park in, in cities, food deliveries, bike lanes, transit lanes, and even uh, so much more, the increasing demands for the curb space, uh, especially in dense urban areas, uh, is, is astounding. And, and yet it continues to be uh, a little bit of the Wild West in a lot of in a lot of cities. And now there are uh, more and more examples, uh, some really great examples we're going to talk about today of trying to tame that uh, that Wild West and really bring some management to the curb, helping it work better, uh, work better for everyone. Uh, let's see, I'm going to take a moment here and share my screen. This is not going to be a slide heavy presentation, but there are just a uh, a couple that we want to uh, uh, that we want to share. So bear with me for just a moment. Um, there we go. All right. So as uh, as Jonah mentioned, I recently became the executive director of the uh, Open Mobility Foundation, uh, stepping into really big shoes left by uh, Yasha Franklin Hodge. Uh, but it's a really exciting time for the um, for the organization. So for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, OMF, it's a international public-private uh, partnership between um, cities and private mobility companies, um, really focused around digitizing infrastructure. It's a pretty unique organization. So that, that partnership um, represented by uh, a board made up of city and public agency um, executives uh, from North America, uh, as well as um, cities and agencies in, in Europe and, uh, and South America as well. And the... Um, focus is really around digitizing infrastructure. And that, um, uh, that's really helping cities um, and the private companies manage the public right of way using uh, open source data standards and software tools. So it's, it's collaborative in nature. Uh, it's it's, it's cross, uh, cross sectors uh, focusing on, on helping cities and companies work towards uh, common goals that's in the sustainability um, equity uh, and and safety space uh, as well, and you know cities for so long have been really good at managing physical infrastructure. Think about just physical signage or concrete, asphalt, bridges, etc. Um, more and more, uh, the our interface with the public right of way and with infrastructure uh, is in the digital realm. And so the mission for uh, OMF is really to help cities have the, the open source data standards and the tools to, to allow that, uh, that um, interface with digital infrastructure um, to occur. Uh, just a little bit about the, some, the work of, of OMF. Um, we are the stewards of a couple of, of data standards that are now used by a, a growing list of cities uh, globally. 
the mobility data standard, something that uh, that you may be familiar with that's uh, being used right now in, in more than 150 cities um, internationally, uh, is a common language between, uh, between city and operators uh, helping the management of of the mobility in the in the public right of way, uh, a key use case for the mobility data specification has been scooters. So we all know there are multiple operators uh, in cities, and um, MDS is the common language that allows cities to to better manage and to regulate these devices uh, in the right of way across operators. Um, MDS is continuing to evolve to look beyond micromobility to include passenger services and the taxi and car share and TNC and, and ultimately uh, autonomous vehicle space as, all, as well. That's, uh, that's really in the, the next iteration of MDS, MDS 2.0. But then more importantly, uh, on for today's conversation, thinking about the curb and our ability to digitize the curb rules and, and regulations that we see expressed every day in physical signage. And I don't know about you, the last time you tried to uh, you know, pull up to a curb, whether that was to drop someone off or to actually park, but, uh, but you know, in many cities, those curb regulations and rules have become increasingly complex and trying to represent them in physical signage is a little bit of a, of a challenge, of a growing challenge. So at its core, uh, CDS is a set of, of APIs that allow cities to digitally represent their curb space and communicate with curb users in different ways. So that um, curb users really understand uh, where the, the, the curb is available for, for them to use at different times of the day in different parts of the, the um, uh, street, but then also for cities to understand how their curbs are being used, like where, when, for how long, and begin to even add pricing as a, as a management tool for the curb. So CDS in practice, uh, a little bit here, but um, uh, help digitally share regulations that I mentioned, uh, moving towards real-time curb status, giving cities the ability to track and analyze curb usage, uh, being able to actually do real-time enforcement, automated enforcement, optimizing curb usage and access to meet policy goals as well, uh, thinking about the ability to incentivize use of the curb for you know, low or zero emissions vehicles, for example. Um, just a, a few uh, use cases that we'll dive into more detail in the, in the next few minutes here. Um, and before I turn this over to our panelists, I wanna reiterate that, uh, that um, OMF is an open source uh, organization. Uh, we encourage you to, to uh, check out our, our website at uh, openmobilityfoundation.org, look at uh, um, becoming a member or becoming an individual uh, contributor. Great thing about developing these data standards in an open source environment is that um, you, know, you don't have to be a, a member to, to engage. In fact, we're trying to create as, as broad and diverse a, a community of contributors as, as possible. Um, so um, feel free to take a look at the, the website for more, more ways uh, to get engaged uh, with uh, these tools that are developing to help us uh, digitize the curb. So with that um, introduction, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. I'm going to ask the panelists to, to tell us a little bit about themselves, a little bit about their work uh, related to the curb. Um, so Regina, I'd love to start with you. Great. Thanks so much, Andrew. Great to be here with some very familiar faces. <laughs> uh, so my name is Regina Kulo, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Populous. Uh, we're a curb and mobility management platform that's now working with over 100 cities around the world. And today I'm going to start with a little bit of the impetus for why I formed Populous as a platform that could help cities build their digital infrastructure to keep up with the rapid pace of mobility innovation. Next slide. So when I was a researcher at UC Berkeley, uh, building forecast models for the Bay Area Regional Agency, um, one of the things I really noticed is that a lot of public agencies didn't have a lot of data or information about the many new mobility services that were quickly arriving on their streets from Google bus to uh, Uber and Lyft. And as private mobility fleets have grown over the past decade um, from Uber, Lyft, shared bikes, scooters, car share, and then rapidly growing delivery services. Um, a lot of the existing problems that we already had on our streets were exacerbated because most city curb spaces uh, and their related policies weren't designed for the whole host of new use cases that were popping out of nowhere. I'm fairly certain, for example, that you can mostly pay 
for parking through 15 minute increments because that's what parking meters allowed for back in the day. Um, but now we've started to see a whole host of challenges from increased greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, which continues to be the largest growing source of emissions. Uh, and then with the rise of micro mobility, we had more and more people that were using smaller modes of transportation, which in and of itself is a net positive, but was very complex to manage from a safety perspective. Um, for instance, uh, we see a lot of large delivery trucks that utilize curb space, and now we have even more people on micromobility that have to try to navigate around them if they're, for example, blocking a bike lane. Um, and it isn't a safe environment, it isn't a sustainable environment, uh, and that's where a lot of our work is focused to help cities digitize and manage that space um, effectively. Next slide. So in 2018, um, a new concept of mobility management was introduced in large part because of a lot of the work that's being done at the Open Mobility Foundation and the introduction of the mobility data specification. And you saw a lot of cities uh, want to play a larger, more active role in managing their public right of way. Um, they were developing new policies to manage, for example, micro mobility programs to shift it from what Andrew described as maybe the wild, wild west to something with, that was a bit more manageable, a bit more safe. Um, and as part of that more dynamic active mobility management, cities began to leverage new technologies such as Populous's mobility manager um, to access data from private fleets that was enabled because of standards like, like MDS. Um, today, Populous delivers micro mobility data, car sharing data, and now curb management solutions in over 100 cities, um, large and small, from Tel Aviv to the city of Oakland. Um, and what we've seen is that Many cities are starting to see better outcomes as a result of being able to create and share new policies. They can also share digitally um, for, around preferred policies for parking for scooters, equitable deployment of vehicles that can help them manage progress towards key public agency goals. Um, next slide. And so with the emergence of um, curb data standards, there are a couple of, I think, key areas that we see as important um, that many cities have questions about um, that they struggle to answer uh, because there isn't really the type of data that they need in order to, to really manage the curb in, a, in an effective data-driven way. So first, you know, we find a lot of cities really just wanna understand uh, what's the demand of the curb? How can you, create a new policy um, to prioritize vehicles and that space if you don't actually know how many vehicles are typically using it, of what size and what purpose. Um, at Populous, we aggregate data that helps cities understand what their demand is at their curbs so they can be more nimble in switching up their curb policies to better manage all the different use cases that are emerging and constantly changing. Um, second, uh, the future of transportation is digital. Um, and increasingly, as more and more fleets are connected, there's a real need for cities to be able to digitally communicate their parking rules um, to those digital connected fleets. Um, at Populous, we've been really involved in um, the Mobility Data Specification Steering Committee and are super thrilled to be part of the Curb Data Specification Steering Committee, uh, which just released their new standard uh, to help cities digitize curbs and parking policies in a way that makes it much easier to share with stakeholders from parking apps to curb operators such as UPS, FedEx, and Uber. Um, and then third, just as a catch-all, there is a lot of other data out there that cities have access to, such as parking citation data, that's very useful and informative to help make decisions that can reduce congestion and improve safety at the curb. So better understanding, you know, where are those conflicts occurring between micro-mobility users um, and larger trucks that might need it for delivery space um, is another key area that we wanna dive into um, as a company to help cities better manage that space for, for safety and, and efficiency outcomes. Um, there's a ton happening in the world of curb management right now. Uh, really excited for this conversation here and um, looking forward to, to the dialogue with the rest of this great set of panelists. Awesome, Regina, thank you. And uh, I wanna remind uh, everyone uh, listening in here, please throughout the, the discussion uh, this afternoon, uh, if you have a question, um, enter it into the, the Q&A option and um, don't feel like you have to wait till the very end. If you get a question in there, you know, I'll try to weave some of your questions into the, the discussion that we're having with the panel here. So um, throw those in there at any time. All right, next I wanna turn it over to, to Kirby. Um, uh, introduce yourself and, uh, and tell us a little bit about the, the work that you're doing related to the curb. Sure, uh, hi everybody. My name is Kirby Olson. Um, I'm the new mobility supervisor with the Oakland Department of Transportation. Um, so when I started with 
Oak Dot about five years ago, I was managing our car share program and our bike share program. And then in 2017, when um, scooters launched, I took that program on as well. Um, and then later on, um, sort of became the, the team lead for our team, which includes on-street parking. Um, so I sort of fell into curb management. Um, it was originally what I was working on, but I guess with a name like Kirby, I probably should have um, expected that I would end up here eventually. Um, but we we started, uh, you know, we adopted the mobility data standard for our scooter program, I think, um, you know, very early on. Um, and we've also been um, sort of a, in a way, an early user of, of curb data standard um, in our car share program. So we work with Populous to um, calculate the fees, the parking fees that are accrued by our car share operator. Um, part of their, their service allows the customers to park at our parking meters any, anywhere within the city um, and not have to get out and feed the meter, but um, we sort of charge them uh, on the back end um, with the help of Populous. Um, but yeah, uh, looking forward to the conversation. Fantastic. All right, thanks, Kirby. Uh, Matty, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, hi, I'm Matty Schaefer. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vade. Uh, we build sort of infrastructure for connected curbs. Uh, we started four years ago, or a little over four years ago. Um, one of the first things we found was the, the decade-old SF Park pilot evaluation, and uh, which used like occupancy sensors um, and all the outcomes that were like listed on it. We were like, whoa, this, this is the solution to parking. Um, and so at, from that point on, we were obsessed with like the concept of real-time occupancy data and figuring out how, how can we make it, like why isn't that in every other city? How can we make it easier to get everywhere it should be? Um, and because we had this just kind of underlying assumption that the more real-time occupancy data that's out there, the better transportation systems will be. Um, and you know, for the first couple of years, we were really focused on traditional parking use cases. Uh, and that was really the world we, we lived in and thought about and focused on. And it wasn't until COVID kind of hit us like a bus, like the lockdown started and then uh, obviously parking revenues were, were plummeting and, and just not much was going on on the consumer parking side of things. But then DoorDash IPO'd and that kind of was a, a moment of realization for us that, that this curb management thing isn't just a buzzword. And uh, the biggest thing that made us realize is like with parking, you know, payment data is not a perfect proxy, but it is a proxy with a lot of the newer commercial use cases, there's just no data to work with and, and cities are forced to operate in the blind. Uh, and so that's kind of, uh, we oriented ourselves around that as our North Star, take, take cities from no commercial uh, activity data to really robust, accurate and granular data. Um, and that brings us to today. We, we help cities understand and manage uh, curb space by measuring how it's used. And we do that with wireless cameras and computer vision. Um, and the specific technology approach we take, uh, it's really all geared around reducing barriers to adoption, which goes back to making it easier to get and adopt so we can start building on top of that with more and more use cases. Um, and the, you know, the, like having wireless hardware lets it work anywhere. We don't need, uh, you know, power or network uh, infrastructure in place. Uh, we do everything fully serviced. So, you know, we, we have field techs and contractors that, uh, you know, we, we provide the hardware, we, we install it, maintain it, the whole nine, um, and, and everything kind of comes in, in, in one subscription. So there's no kind of CapEx on the, on the city side to invest in these pieces of hardware that like, you know, th those aren't valuable in, it, in, in themselves, like alone, what's really valuable is what you can do with it and the data you can generate and what you can do with that data. Um, and so we try to really bring everything as close to the outcomes uh, as possible. Fantastic. Thanks, Maddie. All right, so we've got some, uh, some great you know, experts here kind of approaching this opportunity uh, from, uh, from different angles. And, and you know, I'm really curious uh, on the, the pricing angle in particular, because I think in general, uh, I don't, there's a lot of disagreement that pricing is an incredibly valuable management tool, but overall one that has been underutilized in cities when it comes to managing the, the curb. We now have increasing ways of, of bringing uh, pricing to the forefront to help cities manage the space uh, much more efficiently. 
Um, I know I think back when I ran transit mobility for uh, Seattle DOT, oversaw our parking and curb space management program. And you know, at the time, the, the city's performance-based uh, paid parking program, where we actually based parking rates on demand. Um, of course, at the time, this was this is going back, you know, within the past really decade here. At the time, we hired a consultant and sent a, a team of you know probably interns out to kind of count cars on the on on blocks, and that was the basis of occupancy. And then that was the basis of setting parking rates uh, in the paid parking zones. And if it was below our occupancy targets, we would lower the, the parking rate. If it was above our occupancy targets, we would raise it. It was actually a pretty effective way of, of setting pricing and one that, that very um, successfully took a lot of the politics out of pricing the curb. So no, that's a, the big factor. You can have you know, great tools, but you also have uh, some challenges around just the, the politics of, of um, charging people for, um, for things. So, you know, thinking about today, and, and Regina, first question, for, quick, first question to you. So you mentioned like pay by populace. You mentioned uh, kind of bringing pricing here. How are you looking to work with cities, um, you know, Oakland as well as others, to help them um, better manage the curb through pricing? Yeah, I'm happy to dive into that question. You know, we built a very sophisticated platform around micromobility because it was the solution that many cities were looking for over the last four years. But in a strange way, you know, we do have a very sophisticated way for cities to price access to different zones uh, that can easily be implemented for any connected fleet. Uh, we immediately expanded um, our solution to car sharing. Um, and the dynamic and paradigm there is that many car sharing operators actually have to self-report for their use of the curb. And so we digitized curb rules so that we could easily allow them to pay um, for the space that they used and not be ticketed um, and be able to deploy their fleets anywhere they wanted in a city under their permit. Um, as I think about other modes like commercial delivery, there's really no reason why uh, parking can't similarly be paid for any of those connected fleets. If a vehicle has GPS on it, whether it be on a tablet or driver's phone or embedded in the vehicle itself, which many are, um, we can pull in that data, easily map it to pricing at the curb, and then cities can A, see that data and make more valuable decisions around how to price the curve, as you mentioned, for the use cases that they want to prioritize at certain times of day or for lower emission vehicles, um, and then digitally share that with the many connected fleets that are out there. So we're implementing what we've talked about uh, as pay by populace, which is GPS enabled pricing for really any zone that a city might want to be able to more effectively manage. Kirby, as the as our city representative on the on the panel today, and from a from a city that's really helping lead in in this space, um, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about about your your work in Oakland, and specifically, you you, you touched on this briefly, but but curb management is a very broad um, very broad topic and very broad sort of challenge, if you will. What what sort of specific problem or problems you know, are you facing in Oakland that you're really trying to solve with? Uh, with better better curb management and and sort of the second part there, what's changed recently that you feel like is now allowing you to um, address this uh, address the problem you know in ways that you wouldn't have been able to before? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the problem that we're trying to solve is probably very familiar to anyone that bikes or walks in a dense urban area. Um, which is the that our commercial delivery system is more or less completely broken. Um, and we have commercial um, delivery drivers parking basically everywhere they're not supposed to park, uh, bike lanes, bus stops, bus lanes, crosswalks, you know, no parking zones, et cetera, you name it, um, and causing a lot of really dangerous situations uh, for the citizens of Oakland who are trying to bike and walk and take the bus. Um, and also just generally messing up the entire operation of our, our transportation system. So we, uh, in Oakland, um, about a year ago, finished the installation of our bus rapid transit system. I think the total cost was somewhere around $280 million. Um, and then, so, so we have dedicated uh, red painted uh, center running uh, bus lanes um, and bus boarding islands, et cetera. But um, way too often we have someone deciding to park their delivery vehicle in the middle of that $280 million 
uh, bus rapid transit lane and basically rendering the entire system unusable. Um, so, but at the same time, like delivery is incredibly important, right? To the businesses that are getting their inventory to, you know, even us like me, I have, you know, packages coming in from, from various delivery services. Um, this is something we've all come to rely on. And I don't necessarily blame the drivers themselves for uh, parking in you know, places they're not supposed to because a lot of times there isn't a, a better place for them to park, right? And if there is, um, which is the loading zone, the humble yellow loading zone, um, way too often there's someone parked there who's not loading, right? Who's just a, a regular citizen who's decided that that they found a place that was free and it was open. And so why not park here? Uh, because they know it's gonna be a while before any parking control technicians come and give them the ticket. Um, so basically there's this cascade, there's this chain reaction that occurs of someone who's not supposed to be in the yellow zone being there, the delivery driver not being able to get to loading zone. So they're in the bus stop. And then the, you know, the poor like bus riders who can't get to their bus, they have to walk out into the middle of the street, they have to be exposed to traffic, etc. Uh, the bus is slowed down, and all of a sudden our transportation system is not working um, anywhere near what it should be. Uh, so this is the problem we're trying to solve. It's a problem that I feel like most people just sort of throw their hands up in the air and they say, oh, this is how it's always been, this is how it will always be, there's nothing we can do except maybe we can ticket these UPS drivers or Amazon drivers or whatever. And of course, you know, we hand out thousands of tickets and they pay them and then everyone says, okay, well, this is fine. Um, but I think it's not fine. I don't think that's a good way to manage the system. I think there is, this is not a zero sum game. I think there is a way for this to work better for everyone. Um, and that really starts with the yellow zone itself, the loading zones. Yes, we don't have enough of them, but where they do exist, we need to get the people who are illegally in them out, right? So we uh, did a survey in our downtown and um, some of our most heavily used commercial corridors recently. And we found that at any given time during over the course of the day, those loading zones are illegally occupied half of the time. So half of the time they're basically non-functional for what their purpose is. Um, so if we can get that down by, you know, reduce it to a quarter or 10% or something like that, um, then we'll effectively double the capacity of our, um, of our loading zones throughout the city. So as you were mentioning, Andrew, price is really a, an essential component of how we regulate curb. Um, and for whatever reason, a long time ago, it was decided that loading zones would not be priced. Um, in Oakland and many other cities. And I don't know why that decision was made. It seems like a poor decision in hindsight, but it's um, not too late. You know, the best time to meter your loading zones was 10 years ago, the second best times now. Um, we want to meter our loading zones throughout Oakland. And we, um, happy to announce, we just got, uh, we included a, a budget item for that in our, in our most recent uh, fiscal year 22-23 budget. So um, we appropriated uh, a lot of money to install um, install meters at loading zones throughout Oakland. Um, so that hopefully having a price there will, will convince a certain number of people not to park there. It'll also make it a lot easier for our parking control technicians to, enter, to um, issue citations because they won't have to have any kind of waiting period for um, when, they, when they roll up, they'll be able to scan the vehicle's license plate, look at the meter, see if it's paid. If none of those, if there's no payment initiated, they'll be in, there's no permit uh, for the vehicle, they'll be able to write a ticket. Um, so hopefully that works, but at the same time, we know that the delivery drivers employed by all the delivery companies are not paying meters. They, they just don't do it. You know, you talk to any of the companies, they're like, well, they don't have time. Okay, fair. Um, but we also don't want them to have free use of our, um, of our, of our curb, right? We have some of the most valuable, actually the most valuable company in the world, um, using our curbs on a regular basis. Why is it that you and I have to pay and they don't? They're literally the richest company in the history of this planet. Um, I think they should have to contribute a little bit to um, you know, the maintenance and operation of our streets, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is allow them to pay with their location rather than with uh, coins or a credit card. Um, so that's, that's sort of the idea is that um, we'll create a new class of permit um, that is tied to the, the GPS location of, of these vehicles. Um, and we'll just, we'll invoice them based on their, their true use of the curb. 
um, and something that we've, you know, as I mentioned, successfully introduced with our car share program with our vendor gig car share. Um, and it's something we'd love to, to extend to, um, to commercial delivery. Kirby, this gets to uh, Mary Catherine uh, from, from Seattle uh, asked a question. I think it's related to this. So how, um, how engaged are you finding, or maybe engage isn't the right word, how supportive is probably the better word. Are you finding the, the uh, freight operators are in this, uh, this potential kind of pay by location pricing scheme. You mentioned just better management of that space could double the capacity. And of course, it's valuable for them to have a place at the curb to be able to pull up legally and, and load and unload goods. Are, are they supportive of this uh, approach? I would say I've been met with ambivalence in general. Um, I think they, I don't think they are necessarily calculating the efficiency benefits of this to themselves so like if they if their driver has to park in a place that they don't want to park and cart you know um, packages across the street through moving traffic through dangerous situations in order to get to the curb it's costing them time there might you know their people might get hit by cars occasionally um, you know i'm sure it's not fun for the drivers themselves to have to park easily park illegally and you know all this stuff so I think um, they haven't priced in yet in their minds the efficiency benefits that this is going to create it's also going to put them just sort of on the right side of the way I, I don't know the law is the right word but the way that we want the system to operate right um, so instead of being you know getting tickets all the time they'll they'll have far far fewer tickets so that's another thing to add into the equation right so if the loading zone ticket's $85 and we're charging you $2 an hour to use the curb, that's a lot of curb time that you get for each avoided ticket, right? And in addition to being in the, the good graces of the city um, and helping the entire transportation system to work better. So there's a lot of externalities that they maybe haven't priced in yet, but at the same time, they, I haven't been met with anyone who said, absolutely not, this is outrageous. They've just kind of said, well, all right. And I, if I can chime in, I, I think no, you know ahead, to answer yeah Mary Catherine's question there. I think you know, there are two things that we hear a lot from operators around parking at the curb and asking them to fair pay a fair price. One is that they're already eating tons of parking tickets, right? So that to Kirby's point, there's a certain expected value of how much they need to pay currently. And the other data point related to that is a lot of cities currently spend enormous amounts of money just to collect the parking tickets. So the equipment, staff time, foot traffic, um, there's a stat out of one city that will be unnamed that they brought in 617 million in parking tickets, but spent 809 million for salaries, equipment, and other expenses related to the parking ticket. So that's a total waste, right? For the city and for the operators. Um, but the, the third point um, is really around efficiency. Um, we know that through a great University of Washington, Seattle Urban Logistics Lab report, 28% of driver's time is wasted looking for parking um, on the delivery side. And that's you know time, which is money and, and gas um, that they're already spending. Yeah, great. Uh, Maddie, I wanna circle, circle back to you. So as a, as a you know, relatively new company in this space and, and a hardware company at, at that, in addition to um, software solutions, how does I'm trying to connect the CDS and the curb data spec that that is being adopted by more and more cities? Is that making it easier? How is that making it easier for you to deploy your curb management solutions in in more and more cities? Yeah, it's a good question. It took us like it wasn't until six months ago maybe a year ago that we really started to like think about it a lot and realize the need for it and uh for me personally it was the first time i tried to like make curb lines on a map and like just realizing how hard that was of like why like you know i'd load up open street map and thinking like oh this is going to be easy but it's just not and and um to paint the picture of what we were doing before kind of really forming around CDS. The, the last, like last year's projects were just a, a sequence of, we would rebuild everything essentially from scratch. And it, different projects would vary or differ with in different ways. Like it might be, 
how you calculate occupancy in one area, or it might be how the uh, geographic data is, is stored to, to mark like either parking spots or maybe if they, the only data set available is signs or parking meters. And uh, we, would, we would hard code the logic in for the rules and rates uh, of, every, of every kind of area we were looking at. Um, and we had just would rebuild the data pipelines, we'd rebuild the analytics to match their definitions and formulas. And, you know, it was a great learning experience, but by the end of it, we kind of figured out, okay, we now have a pretty, pretty solid set of standard sort of outputs that we know how to use to better inform a decision, or we know how to drive value from. Um, but now let's, let's, with a, so with a standard set of outputs, what CDS provides is a standard set of inputs of, okay, now we can build the, the pipelines that connect inputs to outputs of uh, here is your CDS curb data and you know, our occupancy data. We can build the pipelines that turn that into valuable analytics that actually inform cities of what's going on at their curb. And we can then reuse those uh, from city to city without having to build it from scratch again. Um, and in a much simpler way, it, it like lets us build products on top of a, a foundation that's actually solid and we know isn't gonna change in a drastic sense anyway. Uh, like real, real foundationally, it, it isn't going to change like uh, the the more architecture oriented stuff. Um, it also lets us form opinions, which I think is interesting around like, okay, if if we have defined a curb zone as at least one space, but it could be multiple 20 foot spaces, that is enough to work off of to form an opinion on how should cities be calculating peak occupancy uh, or turnover or average utilization. And, um, you know, we're not we're not quite asserting our, that we are the end all be all correct, um, but just the, we, we certainly have dealt with enough occupancy data over the years that we have formed those opinions now. And um, on a different angle than analytics, I think integrations, it plays a huge part. Like in the past, it, it was, you have to build a, a, an integration for every single vendor that you integrate with because they have their own data schema and, and, and integration endpoints and whatnot. Um, but now at the very least it's, it's per use case. Um, and if not, if even better, it, it's per like data type. And like, you know that, okay, if we are building an integration for enforcement uh, in one city based on CDS, you know that any other city that, that uh, supports CDS, the enforcement there can use the same functionality, the same endpoints, the same, pro the same data that came from the integration we built there uh, and it will work the same. And I think the reusability in both the, the uh, processing, the analytics, the integrations, I think it's gonna do a lot to push the ball forward um, across, the, across the entire ecosystem. I think it's gonna, it properly incentivizes everybody to, to push their own kind of, uh, you know, their own lane forward. And as a, as a result, the, the, whole, the whole system is improving. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I wanna, um... I want to shift gears slightly because there's a question that was asked that that I love, um, and it actually brings up uses of the curb that I didn't even mention at the my laundry list of uh, of uses at the beginning. But Kirby, a quick follow up for you here from Hannah. Uh, she's curious about the time restrictions for loading, loading, unloading versus parking. Are you mentioned like you know uh, an hourly rate? Are you putting different types of time restrictions on your on your newly metered loading zones? versus other um, like more traditional uh, parking meters? Yeah, we're not changing the time restrictions on our loading zone. So our, it's 30 minutes for commercial vehicles and three minutes only if actively loading for non-commercial vehicles. So you can drop off your friends in a loading zone, but um, you can't leave your car. And then commercial vehicles have 30 minutes, which seems okay. Um, we're, we, haven't, uh, we haven't decided to change that. Excellent. All right, uh, so then this gets to, to Joel Miller's question, former SDOT colleague. Uh, thinking about other curb uses besides just kind of mobility related um, or just traditional parking or loading. So one of my favorite topics, streeteries, uh, otherwise known as like outdoor dining, cafes, other uses of the, the curb lane, the curb space, not necessarily for mobility, but more for placemaking. Mm -hmm. Um, how will data help cities focus 
on improving and managing the right of way for and the curb for these uses. Kind of open, open that's open to all the panelists thinking about thinking about other uses of the curb besides um, just uh, traditional uh, mobility uses. One thing um, that I find really interesting is we found that outdoor dining was really kind of spurred, it was a key impetus for cities to rethink curb management in the coming out of COVID era. And the reason is historically in so many cities, the way that loading zones were designated is a business, whether it was a drugstore or a restaurant would say, I'd like a curb loading space. They would apply for it, the city would grant it, and that establishment would pay for it. So the drugstore might pay for that space. But then if the restaurant had DoorDash or Uber Eats coming into that space, didn't matter, the drugstore had paid for that space up front. And everyone sort of realized, wow, that makes absolutely no sense. Um, and so I don't have an answer to, you know, how should the outdoor dining, well, I guess that with outdoor dining, you could use the same dynamic. That makes a little bit more sense. But um, the old way for loading zones being permitted based on one entity asking for it, everybody in every city um, coming out of COVID is trying to reshape that so that the users of the space pay for it. So the delivery drivers or the door dashers or the Uber Eats are actually paying for the space, which is fundamentally more equitable and just makes a lot more sense. I'll, I'll add on to that with uh, kind of the, the area of this that we focus on is like, there already is a lot of prioritization going on across different user types. And the decisions that have been made over the, last, the past decades does prioritize certain user groups over other user groups and certain geographies over other geographies. And we don't have the, the perfect kind of linking and causality data to show these decisions led to prioritizing these uh, user types. And so it's not necessarily by design or intentional, um, but the first step in my mind is you gotta, you gotta understand what you're currently prioritizing, why that is being prioritized, how the different options of changing things to change the way that it's prioritized according to the objectives and outcomes that the city wants to achieve. Um, it goes to the, the age old adage of like, you can't improve what you can't measure. If you don't know what the current situation is, it's, it's really hard to make decisions about changing it to improve it in the future. Uh, Cause you're gonna, you're gonna end up having unintended consequences uh, just because these variables, there's a lot of variables at play. I think that's I think that's an excellent point, Maddie, and and especially as cities and uh, DOT, just city planners want to encourage more kind of placemaking uses of the of the right of way, and whether it's streeteries or or other types of uses, yeah, you know, there it seems like the common common complaint there is, oh well, you're taking up parking or you're taking up space for loading, unloading. And you know, that, those arguments, of course, can be countered if you've got the, the data that can demonstrate what the actual demand is, the existing demand is you know, before there's a streetery, and then understand how to accommodate that demand in potentially other places. So that's where I think you know, data for the sake of data is not always what we're, what we're striving for, but um, the better understanding um, demand in this case for that precious curb space I think can help just to your point that can help um, cities prioritize then how they choose to use that space um, beyond just traditional uh, transportation uses. I totally agree. And I'll, I'll add one last thing on that is, is in that scenario, you're like, as you're comparing kind of, you know, how many, how many customers of a restaurant does that street to reserve in a night? And then what does that do for sales tax collections from there? Like that is one quantifiable way to look at it. Um, but in the end, it is always going to result with cities having to make the choice of uh, prioritizing certain user groups over other user groups. And actually, like, not just which ones to prioritize, but by how much. Yep. And those are decisions, like, that is the role of, that, that cities are here to play. Um, and it's, it's, those are hard decisions to make, uh, but at the very least, they should be made with the best tools possible. 
you know, the uh, this this challenge of, of curb management uh, is is not just limited to large cities or you know, dense urban areas. And, and James asked a really uh, interesting question related to smaller communities. So smaller communities that don't necessarily have really um, uh, high competition for curb space. Uh, he's asking, are there low investment step cities with fewer resources um, should take if curb space demand is is low or uncertain um, in the today, but you know not known exactly what it will be in the future. Uh, is this something that really only needs to be prioritized in places that are you know dense or with high demand? So what about what about uh, smaller communities or or communities that may not have as much demand today for that curb space? Well, I can kind of answer one kind of anecdote from historically over the last sort of few decade. Uh, a lot of cities have started to shift towards um, the ability for people to pay via a phone. And in many large dense cities, uh, there were parking meters, right? But you might not have had as much paid downtown space um, in smaller communities. And so many of them kind of were able to leapfrog. Um, and they didn't have to deal with meters or trying to transition people off of meters. And so I do think that's one key opportunity is we can expect population to continue to grow. We can expect delivery activity to continue to grow. Um, and, it, and it will also reach those communities as well. Um, and they have the opportunity to leapfrog to, to new solutions, um, just as we saw with you know, pay by phone applications. Yeah. I think that the leapfrogging is a really good point. Um, like if you look at the, the realm of use cases or the whole spectrum of use cases under the umbrella of curb management, a lot of them kind of scale with what infrastructure is in place uh, and what's, what's already, like it's really layering use cases on top of each other. And, you know, five, 10 years from now, as we've built a lot of software across the ecosystem on top of, uh, you know, better data, both static and dynamic data, at that point, the ROI equation will still will work for for those smaller uh, you know cities and towns and townships. Um, and and today, for the forward thinking cities, towns, and townships that are that are on the smaller end uh, right now, it also represents an opportunity to leapfrog and, and get to ubiquitous coverage and unlock all those use cases uh, because ubiquitous coverage. Um, and of course, that's like occupancy data from my perspective. Um, it's it's more attainable if we're talking about 500 on street parking spaces instead of you know 500,000. Um, and in in that sense, it can almost serve as like a model where they can be some of the most advanced uh, systems because they are they are just naturally smaller in scope. Yeah, you know, Kirby, trying to think of this how this question kind of relates to to Oakland, and I'm wondering, you know. You know, Oakland's a pretty, uh, you know, urban has very dense areas, but it also has neighborhoods that are that are, you know, somewhat slightly lower dense. Probably have lower demand on the curb. Are you thinking about managing those places differently? As of now, we're not. Um, it's pretty. In order for us to price the curb, um, we have to go through our city council and have it added via um, ordinance to the municipal code. Uh, which is not an easy or fast process. So yeah. we, um, those areas are, are safe for now from, from my uh, influence. Um, but yeah, I mean, over time, I think, uh, you know, as sort of new commercial districts emerge and, and grow and become more popular, uh, we should and need to be able to um, reevaluate that, that curb use. And I, and I think in large part, in answer to this question, regardless of the on the, the spectrum of kind of uh, rural, suburban, urban, like small, medium, large, the, the need to understand how your curb is being used today and how that relates to demand, I think is somewhat is somewhat universal. And so, you know, even if um, there is less need for pricing or less need for kind of direct um, curb management strategies, that's a great opportunity to, to take the time just to understand who's using the curb, how, when, for what purposes, and then it gives certainly the planners and engineers and, and, and operators of that right-of-way more information 
to think about whether the way the curb is currently being allocated uh, is is aligning with uh, with demand. So that's um, uh, one way to think about it there. The, so shifting gears, one thing that's been a lot on my mind, you know, in our work with the Open Mobility Foundation in particular, is you know is around privacy. And and oftentimes when we think about um, some of these management strategies, you know, we're talking about data, we're talking about you know, whether GPS data or potentially license plate data. That it it, it brings up it inevitably brings up questions of, of privacy. How do how do the three of you um, sort of you know? face this question or you know, kind of answer this question, respond uh, in the work that you're doing? Can you give a few thoughts from the city ahead, side? Perfect. So yeah, privacy is a big issue for us. In, in Oakland, we have a privacy commission that's quite powerful. And basically anytime we procure anything that could be used for surveillance, we have to get their, their permission and their privacy experts. And they sort of really grill us and make sure um, we're collecting the least possible information that we can in order to accomplish our, our objectives. Um, but as a public agency, we're also subject to the Public Records Act, which means you or anyone else can submit a, a request to us for any information that I have is basically yours. Um, I probably shouldn't have said that, but um, <laughs> it's at any given time, whatever I have can be more or less taken. Of course, there's provisions for protecting privacy and things get redacted and uh, some business secrets, things like that. But um, that is a reason that we uh, don't necessarily want to have the raw data feeds from things like our scooter program. And now potentially if we, if we do this uh, commercial loading zone program, we don't want the broad data on our servers. We don't want to have access to your location while you're on a scooter. Um, and so we, we rely on a third party to take that data and in sort of uh, anonymize it and give it to us in a form that's actually safe for our consumption and thus the public consumption. Um, and so, you know, current Populous is, is the vendor that does that for us. Um, and so we sort of rely on their expertise and, and storage and all of that. You provided part of my answer, Kirby, thank you. <laughs> I, we largely view, you know, one of our roles is to help solve for that problem, right? And not having enormous amounts of data sit on city servers where it then is subject to public records requests or where maybe it's easier for police or law enforcement to try to ask for it. Um, because they might be the same department. Um, but kind of digging in a little bit deeper, you know, in addition to aggregating, anonymizing, and then making the key insights that are useful for transportation policy and planning while protecting the rest um, is one of our roles. We do have a lot of conversations, obviously, directly with operators around what are the appropriate use cases of this data, what restrictions need to be in place for them to feel comfortable that the data is secure, and so uh, we actually sit on the MDS Privacy Committee um, and have been very involved in that to help extend MDS into Europe where GDPR is actually more strict than most US privacy laws. Um, so obviously we take it very seriously because it's you know, a part of our job to make sure that we're able to deliver the insights that cities need while protecting um, the data that shouldn't be shared. Great. And I'll chime in as, as the camera guy. Um, we surprisingly, the privacy is, is almost always asked in like debates and in, in more kind of intellectual or conceptual conversations like this. But uh, in practice, it's rarely been a, a real focus area um, that we've seen like just from other stakeholders. But we do think a ton about it and have from the, the second we decided that our model is deploying cameras on city streets. Uh, I sort of philosophically look at it like acting out of fear there, fear is the enemy of making progress. And, and history has not been very kind to the, the entities that choose to avoid or outlaw technology out of fear of what it might cause. Uh, Cause it, you know, it will definitely have side effects and those are just more problems to solve. But in that process, we're moving forward. And that's really important is that uh, we, we should be talking about this and thinking about it, but it shouldn't come at the, the expense of of trying things and seeing what works. And, and it will also involve some mistakes along the way by a, a whole bunch of parties and uh, being able to kind of roll with those punches and, and understand why, and then make sure that the same mistake is never made twice is super important. Um, and I think it is definitely something that has to be more proactive than reactive in terms of those conversations and thinking about it. Like it's gotta be at the design stage, at the architecture stage for software, 
uh, you know, at the at the uh, schematic stage for hardware and cameras. And uh, for us, like the when we first asked ourselves this question, when we were first designing kind of the very early Raspberry Pi prototypes, uh, our answer was kind of like, okay, well, step one, we should make it so we can't be like recognizing faces. And then, okay, how do we do that? Uh, and the answer was for at the time just it's too low resolution to even recognize a face if you wanted to. And then over time, we added a lot on top of that of, uh, you know, encryption and, and you know, blurring and whatnot. But um, thinking about it at the design stage and like making those kind of system architecture decisions that make it so it's like the, the really bad stuff, bad actors can't really even, they don't even have the ability to, to act in bad faith, um, I think is the best and most ideal solution. But we do all need to be prepared that uh, things will go wrong. and it's just about fixing it in the right way and making sure uh, we learn from uh, whatever happens. So with the, with the last couple of three minutes here, I, I wanna kind of think about uh, where this is kind of going in the, in the future and not too distant future, but, um, but what other tools, technology, or even policies do you think we need to advance you know, and be more successful in the, the curb management space. I can uh, start with that. I had a, uh, in one of our projects, this question came up and it was fascinating of, uh, it was a, a license plate kind of double parking enforcement based uh, project. And the question came up of, okay, well, let's, let's step back for a second. If now we can, capture 100% of double parking violations and, and issue citations, every single one that happens. How should the actual citation fine amounts in the enforcement system and st structurally change? Like the, 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 the amount that that citation costs a driver is based on how the system works and has worked uh, in the past, which is only 5%, 10% uh, of violations are being captured. And if you can do 100%, you, you have to, because the whole point of enforcement is to influence a change in behavior, and 100% will drive that change in behavior. But you also need to change the other parts of the system accordingly. And my working, my working thought around that is like, the fine amount should also be variable. And it, it should depend on, did this person have any other option in a X block radius? Uh, or was this their only option? There should still be a fine, because they could always come back later, but uh, I think there are a lot of those types of concepts and questions ahead of, given these structural changes, how does the entire way we approach policy and design that system, uh, how should that change? Good point. Regina Kirby, any uh, last thoughts here? Um, go, ahead, go ahead, Regina, you, you go. Okay, the, I, I would say the first thing I think on the policy front is we're gonna see a lot more cities working to prioritize lower emission vehicles, whether those are smaller delivery vehicles, um, electric delivery vehicles. And that'll be a huge impetus, I think, for a lot of cities to digitize their curves and get their house in order to be able to price effectively those different modes. Um, but the second thing I think we need is a Kirby curb management fan club. <laughs> Kirby's doing a lot in Oakland, that's really cool. And we need to take what he's doing and replicate that in a lot of other cities because they can move faster. It's a great, yes. I mean, spreading the, the, the gospel, right? I mean, helping helping everybody understand and even just what's possible and, and how it's working in different contexts. Um, Kirby, last thought? Yeah, I think just the immediate next nut for us to crack is food delivery. So um, it doesn't really fit well within any of our existing curb designations. So white zones are for passenger loading. You're only supposed to be there while you're actively picking up and dropping off passengers. Yellow zones are for loading materials generally. So you have to be a commercial vehicle to be able to be there for any significant amount of time. If you're a regular passenger vehicle, you can only be there again to physically um, drop, pick, pick people up, drop them off. Um, and so uh, the use case of someone parking, going into a, a restaurant, waiting five minutes for the order, picking up the order, coming out, leaving, it's not, it doesn't fit really within any of those. And so I think we have to figure out um, how and where does restaurant pick up drop off uh, fit within our curbs? Do we need to create a new designation? 
or do we need to loosen you know the definitions that we already have for our existing zones and then of course how do we price and charge someone for all of that activity at our curb well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Kirby, Maddie, Regina, for spending uh, an hour here and sharing your experience and, and uh, expertise in this area. Making progress, still a lot more to do. I mean, this is uh, certainly a, a topic that I think is going to be uh, on the forefront of, of um, uh, certainly city uh, um, city mobility planners' minds for quite some time. So thank you again to, to Curbivore for putting on this, uh, this webinar um, for us. Thank you all for joining and look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank you.